Okay. Hmm. No, so, Donegan, we'll <coughs> shoot off. And would you first of all start tell us about your family, where they came from, all that kind of stuff? Okay. Uh, my father was born in 1882 and my mother in 1901. My f neither of them were from Tremor. My father was from West Cork. Uh, he was reared in Cork City and he came to Waterford to work initially. Uh, he was in the law area so he worked for solicitors and um, Sometime around, before 1916 anyway, he got uh, um, a job with the state solicitor in Tralee. So himself and his wife moved to Tralee. Um, he was uh, very Republican. Um, he was uh, in the volunteers and in the IRB. And when the, the state solicitor discovered he was a Republican. He got the sack. Interestingly enough, he was, he was his first wife, although she was from Clonmel, her, her family was from Tremor. Uh, they were O'Briens and uh, they were builders and they got the job, when, when her folks got the job of building St. Mary's Cathedral in, in Clonmel, they moved to Clonmel. Um, a rather interesting anecdote there was that she got the job of bringing, she was in Common Amon, she got the job of bringing the signalling lamps down to Tralee to signal Roger Casement's submarine. Um, and uh, a funny incident was that uh, in bringing the lamps down, they were carried off the train by uh, a, a British soldier who had chatted her up. <laughs> Uh, anyway, my father eventually got a job in Waterford, interestingly enough, employed by a Protestant called Torrington, a solicitor in Waterford. And uh, uh, he, he then uh, eventually became district court clerk, and that's where he worked for most of his life. Uh, my mother, born in 1901, um, she, uh, uh, her mother was in poor health and uh, essentially her father worked on the shipping line from Waterford uh, to Liverpool. So she eventually she had to be reared to get herself and her brother in, 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 a, uh, in a, a guest house, a, a lodging house. Um, uh, so she grew up, they were both very interested in Irish, although uh, my father's place in Cork, um, uh, Waterfall, the very old people spoke Irish. He, he, they never had a chance of learning Irish in school, but they learned, they taught themselves quite a bit. My father had a, a reading knowledge of Irish, my mother had both a, a speaking and reading knowledge of it and was very involved in music as well. She played piano for Kayleys in Waterford in, we're talking about 1920s, 30s there. Um, my father's first wife died and uh, his second wife, who was my mother, uh, they married sometime before 1940. I appeared on the scene in 1942. Uh, and sorry, Danica, your first, your, your father's first wife, what was her maiden name? O'Brien. Okay. O'Brien. There's still O'Briens in Irish town in Clonmel. Um, the, uh, uh, I had a brother that died very young, quite tragically, he did uh, uh, um, appendicitis that uh, was, wasn't correctly treated. So essentially I'm the only surviving uh, member of my father's family. His first wife had a number of children that died around birth, uh, none of whom survived. and. Um, then my mother had two children and I'm the only surviving one. Uh, the family memories go back obviously quite far. If your father is 1882, your mother 1901. Um, so to be untypical of people my age, that uh, most of them would have had parents that were much younger. I was born in 1942. The war was still on and uh, 
I mean, my early earliest memories. Uh, it's difficult to know exactly when they were memories or versus things people tell you. I mean, I can I can remember people talking about the plane that was shot down or down around the metal bridge, a German plane, and that was I think shortly after I was born. Uh, the other big incident here was Reddy's Garage, which is at the end of Queen Street. Um, they got a mine on, on, the, uh, uh, on the beach and took it up and tried to uh, recover some of the metal from it and the whole place blew up, killing three people. Um, uh, one of my earliest first memories is, is the place this Tremor Hotel that's now derelict was a private house. And it was owned by a lady called Miss Poy, who seemed to be quite a wealthy lady from uh, South Kilkenny. And her servant man arrived at the door one time to say that uh, there, our li the little boy here had been throwing ca cabbage stumps over the garden wall and one of them nearly hit Miss Poy. So I must have been much smaller than the garden wall at that stage. But my memory of it is that uh, about two weeks afterwards, uh, her servant man arrived up back at the door to say, Miss Poy would like to meet the young boy who's been so good. So I can remember being led in through a corridor and up to shake hands with this bedridden old lady who, uh, who presented me. And this was quite incredible at the time because just after the war, presented with an enormous box of gourmet chocolates, which uh, were just un unobtainable. I don't know where she's got, but that's one of my earliest memories. I suppose I could say uh, the difference between Tremor then and now is a much smaller town. Housing estates didn't exist. Even, say, Otterne Terrace, I think, m must have been built around the time I was very young. Like Tremor Heights, um, all the housing estates, none existed. But the town was very densely populated. Most people running businesses lived over the business. Very few do that now. Um, Queen Street alone uh, had between 30 and 40 school going children in it. Um, of course, there were very few cars around, so the whole town was a kind of play area for children as well. Um, the schools at the time uh, was when you started off the first two years, if you were male, you went to the convent, junior infants and senior infants, and then you went to the Christian Brothers primary school after that. The primary school uh, had very, very hard working people running it because um, there was just three classrooms for six classes. So each teacher had two classes and there was something a bit less than 60 students in each class. Uh, I'd hate to get that job to do today, but I think we're, we were probably of necessity much, much better behaved than, than children nowadays. We tended to do what we were told. And of course, physical punishment was you, you, got, you expected to get slapped every day, which wasn't as bad as it sounded because after, after a few weeks, the, the skin on your fingers got so tough that slaps didn't really count very much. You pretended they, were, they hurt you much more than they actually did. But um, I, uh, with the people there, a lot of my classmates, you know, went on and did well. Now, secondary school at the time during, um, was very meager. Uh, the school living age was such that people had to do I think a year after primary education. So there was a big demand for the lower bit of what it would now be secondary school. Uh, the, uh, at the time of the war, I understood that the, uh, the science equipment in the school was stolen, was sold just to keep the school going. So there was no science being taught. So if you wanted to do a, a, a leaving cert, with the full range of subjects, including science, you had to go into Waterford. Um, and at the time, uh, there was quite a few of the people in my class went, 
continued their secondary education in Waterford. I went into De La Salle. Um, at, um, I, my father was still working, so I used, he used to drive me in every day. One thing I should just go back to, uh, a few things I remember about early Tremor. One was that there had been gas in the town. There was gas works beside the uh, railway station. And a lot of the fittings were still in houses and there was some very, very elegant street lights that ceased to be used. I understand before, around the time of the Second World War, it became impossible to keep the gas going. It was going in Waterford. I can remember in Waterford, the streets were still lit by gas. A man used to go around every night when it was getting dark with a pole and switch on each light individually and then later in the night go around and switch them off. Um, I also remember by far the most impressive piece of technology ever in Tremor was the steam engine. The steam engine, I think, was there until sometime into the 60s. So this uh, pulled the carriages out from... Waterford, the steam engine was disconnected, turned around, filled with more water, and then went to the other end of the train and went back into Waterford. Uh, those days as well, you have to remember that there was no Joe Walsh tours or whatever the equivalent nowadays of flying to the sun. That was either unavailable or un certainly it was unaffordable, but it, it hadn't become a practice. So. The holiday places in Ireland, the main holiday place was was Tremor, and Tremor was incredibly busy during the summer. It's, it's difficult to realise now, but every house in the town, if they had spare rooms, even if they hadn't, they often lived in the shed themselves during the summer and rented whatever rooms they had. So the population of Tremor would probably have gone three or four times what it would normally be. Um, uh, the 15th of August race meeting was an enormous affair. Um, I mean, we used, um, my, my, my mother used to organise uh, the, the, the evening meal in the window at the front and we see all the people passing. Um, Queen Street would be every bit as busy as a busy Grafton Street and, and during, during race week. And of course we'd inevitably see relations that would be invited in. Um, to get back to the schooling, uh, quite a few of us went, uh, did our secondary schooling in either Mount Sinai or De La Salle. And uh, after that, either went into um, local jobs if they were available. There wasn't that much, or if our parents could afford it, went off to university. Um, I went to UCC, I did a science degree, which... Um, uh, was very much in demand at the time. To, with the science degree, you could very easily get a job teaching, which uh, gave me uh, enough money to do a few more degrees. I, I did a music degree, which was my main interest. My parents persuaded me, however, if you you know, you never get to work doing music. So uh, I was also interested in science, so I went for the science degree at that time. Um, I worked... Uh, initially in Cork, worked in Fermoy, then back in Cork, and I moved back here when the WIT, which was then the Regional Technical College, was opened. I can remember going in there and um, the place had just opened its doors for its first lot of students when I arrived. So. I was uh, involved in, in, in the development there from the very start. Um, science technician courses initially and of course the other thing that was coming at the time was computing courses uh, which uh, at the time I was in UCC there was no computers in the country uh, that I can... I, if, if there was one, it, was, it would have been a very primitive one. The first one to arrive in, in UCC was after I finished my degree there. And of course, um, I had a background in mathematics. And uh, if you're in education, people in the mathematics area tended 
to learn about computers. Uh, I mean, nobody teaching computers actually did a course in computers because there was no courses there. So the very early computer um, education was uh, was self-taught. It had to be. It was the only way of figuring out what these things were. Um, in 19... It was 1970, uh, um, WIT started. Uh, in 1980, or slightly before it, the, the first lot of computer courses started. And eventually we proposed, I put together plans for the first degree course there. Um, there wasn't a, 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 a consensus that these colleges should be running degrees, and that was a major political issue between people who thought they should stay on technician education or should develop. Um, the computing degree there was the first degree to be approved. And as far as I can remember, that was 1980. So that took off and took off in a major way, developed. Um, in 1991, then I moved to the University of Limerick uh, and I worked there until I retired around um, 2005. Uh, so I've been back here since. Okay, so can I kind of go right back then to to war in your childhood? And yeah. uh, you mentioned a few things, but just even things like horses and carts. Yeah. You know, like it, it was very basic in those days, wasn't it? Well. Um, one of the things that was glaringly different was the difference between the town and the countryside around it. The town had electricity, the countryside hadn't. It was around the mid-1950s to 1960 that rural electrification happened. And I actually lived in the countryside for a while. Uh, we, used, we used to live up in um, Man Valley, up in the, the Commerce, during the summer. And uh, uh, living without electricity meant that you had no cooker, you used either oil or lit a fire, you had no heating, generally you lit a fire. Uh, light, you used oil lamps or tilly lamps, which were very bright oil lamps. Uh, but even the more uh, limiting thing was there was no pumps. Because you need electricity to run pumps. So you had no running water. Uh, we used to have to take two buckets up to the well. Uh, I remember where I was up in, up in the Cummers. You, you, I had to go up a hill, down through a forest, across a river to a place called Toparanima would get the water there and bring them back and that was our source of drinking water and water for washing and that um, so and the same applied in Tremor there was this huge difference between the town and the county now you asked about horses and carts yes there was very few cars around uh, cars were pretty well unaffordable uh, for most people um, goods were largely delivered by train. The, the steam train would come out. The steam train had carriages for people, but it also had goods wagons. And the, the material would come out on the, uh, on the train. For example, um, this place was a cake shop. It was Greer's Cake Shop then. But the cakes used to come out every day after when they were baked in water and put on the train, taken out here. When they arrived here, a uh, horse and cart, they were collected. I think Tony Murphy was the main person at the horse and cart. And his main job was collecting goods from the train and delivering them around the town. Um, uh, the very little machinery to do things. Uh, the building and that would have happened very manually. Food production. Um, at going back to uh, the you know 1950s, very little food was imported. So um, 
which was nice in one way in that you had seasons, you had, you know, the arrival of strawberries. Uh, this was a big occasion. Um, the new potatoes coming. Um, uh, you had basically a lot of green vegetables in the summer, but you had root, mainly dependent on root vegetables, some winter cabbage, but mainly turnips, parsnips, carrots during the winter. Um, uh, you had quite a lot of businesses. I mean, if I can remember Queen Street in Tremor, it had the place next door where Red Lane is, was a pub. It was owned for a while by Keneally's. It was a pub and uh, a sort of mini hotel. It was known as the Ossery Inn. Um, if I go down the street, then you had the Vic, which is pretty well as it was, much smaller scale, but it was also a guest house. Um, there was uh, uh, a number of grocery stores. Martha Powers Pub was there. Um, uh, as I said, there's a confectionery shop here. Um, there was a butcher, Torpy's butcher, towards the end of the street. So there was quite a lot of uh, business, day-to-day -day business. Powers over was one of the main uh, grocery stores in the place. Um, with the garage at the end, Reddy's Garage. Um, where the V is now was the post office, the post o and the drapery store. The post office uh, wasn't just for parcels and letters and stamps. It was also the telephone exchange. The telephone exchange in Tremor was something like a patch bay that you probably have in your recording studio where you plugged you, you made the connections. Tremor, tele, Tremor telephones didn't have a dial. They had a, a ringer, which this little dynamo inside that rang a bell in the post office, and uh, you told them what, uh, what number you wanted, and they took the patch bay and connected you into the, into the numbers. That, that was the other thing in, com in the communication side, telegrams were very important. So there was a person employed full time there whose job it was to cycle around the town with the telephone messages as they arrived and gave them out. And of course you could send telephones from there. Um, there was uh, a bookie's office, of course, <laughs> close at hand. Um, butchers, another butchers, Malloy's butchers over there, and probably quite a few hairdressers and barbers and quite a few things that I don't remember. I'd, I need a bit of time to remember everything, but and, to give it. You said that your your father's first wife was a musician. No, my mother. I'm not oh, sure whether she was or not. Okay. Uh, but my mother, was yeah, it? played the, the piano. Okay. And uh, is that where you got your music interest? Possibly. Yeah, yeah. I can remember just being influenced by listening to music, and uh, probably more so. I was the odd one out in the class because I. Uh, I used to remember pieces I heard, and um, I can't remember back. Uh, there was a choir in the church that, from school, we would have participated in from time to time. Uh, there was an organist there, J.C. Cusick. Uh, uh, I'm just thinking of occasionally, I, I mean, I can remember, say, the Radio Iron Symphony Orchestra visited here, uh, Waterford and would play in the Olympia Ballroom. You know where the Olympia Ballroom was, yes. Um, and I can remember being at some concerts. In fact, I can remember some of the pieces of music I heard for the first time there. The music kind of sticks in my mind once, if I'm impressed by it. And you said you wanted to be a musician? Yeah, initially I thought, yeah, yeah. Now I was, I, I, I played the piano, but not very well, so maybe it's just as well that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> try a career in that area. And was it classical or was it Irish? What was it? At initially it was classical. Uh, later on when I was in UCC I took, well Irish music was always there. My mother played quite a bit on the piano and I was always aware of it and listened to some but I think around the time I was in UCC I took more and more of an interest and um, when I uh, when I graduated in science, I instead of going full time teaching in that, 
I did mainly part-time teaching and got enough money to do a music degree. And I was extremely lucky at the time because one of the people who had just arrived in the department was Sean Arena. The other p person running the place, pretty well single-handed, was Alice Fleischmann. And I was taught the piano by his mother, Tilly Fleischmann. Now, Tilly Fleischmann was a pupil of, was from Munich. She was a pupil of a man called Stavenhagen, who in turn was a pupil of Franz Liszt. So I had a direct line from Liszt down through Stavenhagen and Tilly Fleischmann to mm. things I learned. It, it was an extremely good time to be there. Um, I suppose in many ways, one of the best times of my life. Um, uh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was really good. Yeah. And with the Irish music, did you did you ever? I mean, did Sean O'Reilly play in sessions, or did he just was he? More he was teaching history of Irish music theory. He was he had an extremely keen ear. I've never come across anyone who could uh, who could hear. I mean, one of the exercises you'd get is to um, to sit down at the piano and improvise four part hymn. No, Sean O'Reilly would look out the window and he could tell uh, there are certain rules in, 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 in writing har uh, uh, harmony and counterpoint, like you can't move notes in parallel, like parallel fifths or octaves. Um, uh, you have to stick to four parts. And he, like this, he, he would say, you know, uh, your, your alto has reproduced if you played five parts. So you soprano, alto, tenor and bass, those are what we call the four parts. Um, it, it, there, it was an incredible um, ear facility. I've never come across anyone with this acute an ear before. Um, and did you start playing then? You say socially you come No, I didn't. I never really played. I, I did some teaching of music in, in secondary school. Um, and um, when I moved to Waterford, of course, it was, a science, uh, it was in the science area, to, went into the computing area. But I had plans to do, um, to combine music and computing, which I worked on for a long time. Eventually did a PhD in a particular area there, but uh, uh, you know the, the the huge potential for music and, and technology was only just beginning to get realised. Uh, uh, then I set up um, a music technology, a le uh, part of the music degree in Waterford when I was there. When I went to UL. I uh, I eventually I set up a master's course in music technology, which is very successful. People from all over the world coming. There was always at least one person from America and one person from Europe, and we had people from India and that, and, <laughs> and that every year. It's interestingly enough now it's it's uh, it's 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 less in demand now because the thing is so. Uh, it's so common, you know, but music technology was something very new, but now it's 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 made its way into an undergraduate course, so there's no need so for, for, for the master. The masters are still running, but with very relatively few students. I mean, we used to have no trouble finding 20 students to do them, to register for the masters one time. Yeah. Amazing how it changes. Yeah, well, <coughs> technology changes. I mean, you just uh, connect, take a piece of equipment you bought 10 years ago and trying to connect it to something that you bought today. You find you, you need to buy extra equipment or extra leads to do the link because the technology itself has changed. And of course, the companies do that on purpose as well because it's extra money for them to get people to buy more stuff. It's just not the only reason, but... When, when you were small, do you, do you remember any interesting characters around the town in Tremor that you, can, that you recall? Any yeah. interesting older characters? There was a guy called the Boar Collins. I hear more people talking about him. He had, um, he had a strawberry nose. And I think 
he might have been called the Boer Collins because he was some way connected with the Boer War, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, if I can uh, use something <laughs> not for publication, Tom Mackey had the story of uh, the Boer Collins down at the railway station where two young fellows were shouting after him, go away yourself and your big nose. And the Boer Collins, who was noted for his wit, kind of <laughs> said, who are these two snots running down my nose? <laughs> so, Very good. So that is... Uh, <laughs> don't put that on the, on the radio. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, that was uh, those. I can remember a lot of Nicky Whittle, who was involved in the Tremor ambush. He used to be known as Lazarus Whittle because I think he, he got shot and kind of rose from the dead. That's why they called him Lazarus Whittle. Um, he used to live at the foot of the street for a while. Um, a lot of old, the old Tremor characters. I can remember, I must, I must have been kind of five or six, but uh, my father built a glass house at the back and it had all the, a lot of the tradespeople from Tremor the builders, uh, you know, carpenters, and so I, I knew how to cut timber and mix mortar and cement, and mix uh, concrete and mortar, because I'm sure it must have been an awful nuisance to them. There was uh, an old man, Tom, uh, Reddy, Tom Reddy, I think, um, uh, there, um, I can remember a young man, Mick Nugent, you know Betty Nugent, yeah, her, her father, as a young boy, was, was working on that. He was, very, he was young, well, most of the people working were older. My father had the story of, of some people who were, uh, I don't know if it's true, but it's, it sounds a funny story. They were building and building and drinking and drinking, and if <laughs> they, they forgot to put a door on <laughs> <laughs> and the building <laughs> that they built <laughs> for a while. <laughs> they kept building windows on it. <laughs> Probably made up, but... Uh, uh, any other characters? Let's see. I'm sure there is. Uh, I mean, your dad sounds like he's a good character as well. Well, it's hard to judge your father because he's there all the time, but, uh, I mean, I would have known him... He was 60 when I was born. So, I mean, he would have been in the 70s and 80s when, um, you know, when I would have had a, a sort of a relationship with him that I can remember. Um, he used to read quite a lot. I used to get the job of going, oh yes, one of the things at the end of the street was the library. The place where the bridge club is was known as the assembly rooms. And that was for, held, used for meetings, for putting on plays, but two nights of the week it became the library. And the library consisted of a whole lot of, of presses around the periphery of the room that were unlocked. And there was a Mrs. Brown was the librarian there. So I used to get the job, especially when he became less mobile, to, to go down and get him out books. And, and what kind of books did he read? Uh, he was probably history, and I think history would be the main thing he'd be interested. He was interested. I have his books downstairs. He's also interested. He's very interested for some reason in Russian, like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and people like that. With quite a few books in that area, uh, but mainly history books. Um, it's Did you so. Get the Irish language for him though. Uh, well, it was there. He didn't have a speaking knowledge of it. He, uh, he had a reading knowledge. He had a number of books, some of whom were Kaint and Shanna Hale and those from Ring that he used to read repeatedly. Uh, my mother would have had a, a speaking knowledge, but wouldn't have used it kind of day to day either, but was there all the time in the background. Um, uh, I suppose when I went to UCC again, it was more visible there. 
uh, what there was a, a professor of Irish Sean O'Toma I attended when, when you do a music degree you have to do a language in the first year so I did him I uh, did his the Irish which was very good because I was in, in that I was studying the the text of the songs <laughs> and at the same time in the music degree I was studying the songs so the two came together very well and, and Joe, when you came back to Warford, what was the music, the trad music scene, what was that like in Warford at that stage? It wasn't anything in your face. You had to go and search out. Uh, I mean, I was aware of the Mackies here, but I didn't know them. And I can remember, um, I heard there was a session in Phil Grimes, I think, on Tuesday night. So I went in there and introduced myself to them and uh, on the way home brought them in for a cup of tea and, and showed them all the stuff I had and they couldn't believe that you know, I had recordings of very old musicians going back to going back to 1900s the, from the old uh, cylinders um, that I had got copies of. Um, so that was my first real meeting with traditional musicians here. Of course, the big person then I met afterwards was Tommy Carney, who was one of the best Dylan Pipers in the country. Again, very private individual, not... Uh, he didn't promote himself. But he, he'd come out here as a drop of a hat, and we used to, we used to go out down in Tremor Hotel frequently, playing with uh, other people. Um, and then, of course, the, the younger people started to, around, around the 1970s, um, there was uh, one night a week where uh, people of interest um, used to meet in, uh, is it called, there's a hall there beside Jordan's when you go in. What's that hall called? I think it's Central Hall. Yeah, yeah, we used to meet there one night a week and uh, quite a few of the young people um, started taking an interest. Tommy Keane would have been one of the people who kind of flew once he started developing. Um, Pat Burns, um, um, Jimmy O'Brien Moran would have been later on. He was too young at that stage. But there was quite a lot of musical activity. Again, on a very low scale, you had to search it out, find it, and then go and pursue it. Um, uh, and Watford did have a history of Irish music. Yeah, certainly. Um, again, it was... I mean, you, you, obviously one place you'd have in the songs would be in Ring. Um, and there's a lot of songs specific to Ring as well that you, you wouldn't, historically you wouldn't have found anywhere else. Um, uh, it was there, but for some reason, I mean, you used to have Kayleys, okay, but the music you'd need for a Kaylee wasn't that sophisticated, and, and it couldn't be, because you had a few musicians playing and they just had to play. Keep rhythm was the main thing there. But um, playing, individual playing, I mean, people would participate in concerts. They might be asked for a fundraising concert. Would they play? And they'd play one or two pieces. But that was the level of activity. There was nothing more formal than that. There was no formal lessons except, you know, maybe a meeting once a week where people would go through, people who could play would go through with people who were learning, go through a few tunes. Um, but if you go way back, I mean, you had people like the Flanagan Brothers and all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned, was it Talbot you mentioned earlier on? William Talbot, yeah, who was reared in Tremor, although his, a lot of his life was outside of Tremor. I mean, there, there are things generally not known about, in, if I take the kind of wider area, one, the very first major books on Irish music, of the music that was written out as it should be, was 
by a guy uh, called O'Farrell from Clonmel. He published these in London. And a lot of Waterford, like there's the Waterford Waltz in it, and uh, there's a few more tunes with Waterford connection. But this was, so the whole area around it going back, this is 1800 now, it is one of the, one of the very earliest and one of the best. He also wrote a, a tutor for the Gillen Pipes. Uh, I, I came across, I have, I have a, a photocopy of his stuff downstairs. Yeah. That's probably your cue now to do it in tune for us. Oh dear. <laughs> well, I can, uh, this now is going to take a while because I'll have okay. to try and tune sure. up and see if it will work yeah. and maybe maybe try it, try it once and without recording me and then you can try it. <laughs> if it works. But, uh, it's the, the most... This is known as a popping pad, and it's it's there to ensure that you don't leave any air out. Uh, a traditional Velcro, I can see. Hmm? You have the tra traditional well, Velcro. Well, out. well, it's you, uh, whatever. Did something fall out of me or that you? That was me. Oh, good, because things fall out of the pipes too. I will leave it at. Um, is there anything you want to say about, just to finish off, just about Trevor or about how you see it's changed and all that kind of stuff, or where it's, you know, how do you see it now? Well, I think the main concern is that the centre of the town has diminished very much. And whereas the, the big challenge is to try and reintegrate the town because you, you have very large populations on the edge of the town what was very densely populated town centre has become sparsely populated. And I think it's, a, it's, it's something people don't realise that living in the centre of the town as opposed to living, let's say, up in Tremor Heights, things are much more convenient. Uh, it's a very beautiful environment. You have lovely views from an awful lot of it, as you can see here. Um, three minutes, you're down on the prom walking, having coffee and tea there or wherever. Um, I know when we were getting this house renovated, we rented a house up near the golf club in, in, in Tremor Heights. And it was like living out in the country. I mean, the only, uh, even if you want to go for a pint of Guinness, and we didn't particularly like the Ritz, but you, you had to walk a huge amount. Whereas every, or to go to a shop to buy a pint of milk, uh, you had to go down to the cove. Here I just cross the road and get it. I can get the daily newspaper. Um, the Don Rail is close at hand. It's really a lovely place to live. Very quiet place to live too. Um, I mean, the walls, you, if you have a bit of noise in the street at night, the walls in the old houses in, in, in the town centre are so thick, it's not a problem. Um, You're a townie at heart. Well, I don't know what I am at heart, but uh, certainly to uh, Tremor is, is the centre of Tremor is someplace I'd recommend to anyone to live in. That uh, it is, uh, it is, and the old houses, the old houses are are so well built that uh, even though you might be in a terrace, effectively you're you have the same as a, a totally private house without anything touching anything else. The walls are so so thick in, in the old part of the town. Now, if you go to a newer part, I know we, for a while we lived in Sweetbriar and our first night there in Sweetbriar, we heard the person next door snoring. You know, our bed was at the back of the wall. Now the walls in town center are much, much thicker than anything that's been built since, you know, in, 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 in recent times. Absolutely. Donica, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was great. very good. I, mean, I was really interested. Very fascinating it's to hear. It's very important here with all this stuff yeah. around me. And and I'm sorry I haven't played. Uh, uh, maybe if you're filming, I could practice something and, and play something a bit better if you're filming somewhere.